Heavenly Father, just as we sang the words, your grace is enough. Thank you that it is. I came to church heavy hearted and I, you have lifted it so much. It's so important that we come together. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you've done. Continue blessing us as Ryan brings the message, dear Lord, that we will take it with us through the rest of the week. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. This morning, I want to start out a little bit different. How many of you are familiar with Monty Python? Unfortunately. Yeah, so this is, this is not a, uh, uh, a marketing thing to try to convince you to watch Monty Python. Don't get that idea. Um, but anyway, I was just reminded, you know, you can find inspiration in pretty much anything if you're looking for it. Um, and I found some inspiration thinking about a Monty Python scene this past week. So Monty Python is a British comedy group. Um, and any of you who know anything about British comedy know that it's a little bit different comedy. Um, they have their own sense of humor. So in this particular scene, this is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. We have this group of knights who are on a quest. Uh, you got Sir Lancelot. You've got Sir Robin, who is also known as Brave Sir Robin because he's not. And then you got Sir Galahad, and you've got King Arthur. And they're approaching a bridge across this very deep, very foggy gorge. It looks like it could have been filmed in Fancy Gap, but it's pretty much what all of England looks like. So foggy gorge, and they have to pass over this bridge in order to continue on with their quest, with their journey. But then out hops this old man, who's this little, tiny, creepy-looking old dude. All right, he's the bridge keeper. And he says, stop. Who would cross the bridge of death must answer me these questions three ere the other side he see. Oh, well, they're a little freaked out by that. So they kind of step back. But you know what, Sir Lancelot, we all know Sir Lancelot, right? He's the brave one. So Sir Lancelot steps up and says, I'll answer him. I'm not afraid. Bridge keeper says, what is your name? He says, well, my name is Sir Lancelot of Camelot. What is your quest? To seek the Holy Grail. What is your favorite color? Blue. Oh, all right, then off you go. And Sir Lancelot says, oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And he walks over and crosses the bridge. Well, after seeing this, all the other knights are, you know, they're feeling pretty good about themselves now and getting across, so they all run up there to be the first one to do it. And of course, uh, as you can guess, the first one who steps up is brave Sir Robin, now that he knows it's easy. Stop. Who would cross the bridge of death must answer me these questions three or the other side, he see. And Sir Robin now, uh, impatient and, and a little arrogant, uh, brave Sir Robin tells him, ask me the questions, bridge keeper, I am not afraid. He's good on the first question, what's your name? Sir Robin of Camelot. Second question, what's your quest to seek the Holy Grail? Third question, what is the capital of Assyria? Uh-oh. Robin says, I, I don't know that. And he's thrown by this unseen forest, ah, off into the gorge to his death. It's a horrible thing. Uh-oh, not so easy anymore. Sir Galahad's up next. Maybe he can do this a little bit better. He knows what to expect now. First two questions, he's good. He knows his name. He knows the quest. Third question, what is your favorite color? Oh, good. Galahad's heard this one before, so he says, blue. Oh, no, wait. Red. Ah! And he gets thrown off into the gorge. And finally, King Arthur steps up to the plate. What's your name? It is Arthur, King of the Britons. What is your quest to seek the Holy Grail? What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Now, when you hear this, if you haven't seen the movie, you might think that this is an absolutely impossible question uh, for Arthur to answer. But if you've seen the movie, you know that he spent about 10 minutes in the opening scene having an absolutely pointless conversation with two French guards about swallows and about airspeed velocities and which one could carry a coconut and all sorts of British humor stuff. 
So he is actually providentially informed and ready to answer this question. And he rightly asks for clarification. Well, what do you mean? An African or a European swallow? And the bridge keeper answers, I, I, I don't know that. And he's thrown into the gorge. And that kind of wraps up our scene. So I know the question on most of your minds. Pastor, what is the point of starting a sermon with a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Honestly, I don't know. It just cracks me up. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. There's, there's a point, of course. So today's message is, what if we seek God first? These knights in the movie, they all profess to be seeking the Holy Grail, but two of them got tripped up, and it prevented them from completing their quest. And for a lot of people, I think that tithing and being good financial stewards as part of our quest to seek God can get us greatly sidetracked by irrelevant details. Today's goal, in part, is to clarify some of those details uh, about what tithing is and it isn't, all those kinds of things, and then see if we can't get back to the bigger picture of questing after the Holy Grail of all Christians, seeking God Himself. By the way, the capital of Assyria is? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, all of you. Ah, gone. <laughs> well, bridge keeper, here's the answer. Depending exactly on what time in history you're referring to, Assyria has had four capital cities. You've got Asher, Kala, Khorsabad, and the one that some of you Bible historians may have guessed, Nineveh, where Jonah went. You guys remember Jonah, right? All right, and you don't get thrown into the gorge, you can stay. All right. We are going to start uh, this morning in Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 34. I hope that this is a familiar passage because we have actually already studied it through our sermon lesson through Matthew. Um, I'm not going to be repeating a previous sermon on this. This is just kind of our jumping in point today as we're talking about these details um, of tithing and giving. So we're going to start in verse 19. And if you remember, this particular d discourse in chapter 6, this is part of um, the Sermon on the Mount. This is just a little bit after Jesus has given the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then he gets to this part, and this is what he says, starting in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Sound familiar? All right, good. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Some of yours might say mammon. You cannot serve God and money. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? And which of you by worrying can add a single day to his life span? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed, him, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what are we to eat, or what are we to drink, or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When we take this entire picture and kind of put it all together, what Jesus is giving us here is a picture 
of proactive generosity. Proactive generosity. What he's telling us is we don't need to worry when God is in control. Amen? It's a good message for this morning with everything going on. We don't need to worry when God is in control. And because we don't need to worry, because God is in control, then we are free to pursue generosity. We're free to pursue generosity. That's a big deal. When you look at your life, when you look at how you handle your finances, since we're still in stewardship month, where do you place your hope? Do you place your hope, do you find your assurance in money? If you can just have enough of it, then nothing bad can happen to you. If you can just have enough of it, nobody can take that away from you. If you can just have enough of it, everything will be just fine. Or do you place your hope and find your assurance in God? Tithing is just one measure that God has given to us that He's instituted to help us get our minds and our hearts right with regard to money. But I think it's one thing to say it, but I think it's also something to to recognize that that's where a lot of people start getting confused about the details. This is where we start getting tripped up and thrown into that foggy abyss. So here's the what it is and what it isn't part of the sermon, all right? So let's talk first what it's not. What is tithing not. Well, first of all, it's not a tax, all right? You're not going to require a tax return. We're not going to ask you for one as a church. Um, God doesn't need to because he already knows it anyway. Um, There's no income verification for us. Uh, Nobody's going to come knock on your door for what you owe. Um, (laughs) Back to finding inspiration anywhere. I read that um, after I wrote it and came back to it. I'm like, how do I illustrate that, that they're not going to come knock on your door for what you owe? Uh, (laughs) And for me, and this probably says something about me, very unfavorable, um, it reminded me of Happy Gilmore and the fact that, uh, (laughs) good. So in Happy Gilmore, um, this guy's grandmother, um, the the tax people come to take her house and all of her things away because she didn't pay her taxes. That's not what we're talking about with tithing. All right, so it's not a tax. It's also not the leftovers, right? Malachi 1.8. And when you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not evil? Or when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not evil? So offer it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of armies. And uh, Numbers 1829, out of all your gifts, you shall present every offering due to the Lord from the best of them, the sacred part of them. It's not to be what's left over. That's not what we give to God. Our tithing shows that we are putting God first. So it's not a tax. It's not leftovers. It's also not a bribe, right? There is no set amount of money because there is no amount of money that will buy your way into heaven. It's also not a bribe to your church or your pastor. (laughs) Um, And I throw this one out there because I've actually heard it, thankfully, mercifully, not here, Um, I have actually heard it stated to me before that um, X part of the church gives all the money and therefore the music needs to be what they want to hear. No. (laughs) No, we need to be pleasing to God in everything that we do. So it's not a bribe. There's no quid pro quo with me or with the church and especially not with God. It's also not a fundraiser for the church. We do church fundraisers, right? We do it all the time. We've got things that we need to raise funds for. Um, But tithing is not something that we do when we need to put a church, a new roof on the sanctuary. That's above and beyond tithing, right? But tithing is a very very certain thing. It's also not an option. Now we're getting into the hard stuff. It's also not an option. Deuteronomy 14, 22 through 23. 
You shall certainly tithe all the produce from what you sow, which comes from the field every year. You shall eat in the presence of the Lord your God at the place where he chooses to establish his name, the tithe of your grain, your new wine, your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock, so that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Shall is one of those words as you're reading through that has a little bit of extra force to it. It's got a little extra oomph. It's God saying, there's not really two ways about this. You shall do this. And he even tells you why. So that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. God has a point in telling us to do this. And it's to get our minds right. It's to get our hearts right. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. There's a lot of things that as people of God we're called to do. And God in most cases doesn't give us a multiple choice selection. Would you like this or that? Would you like to do this or that? He tells us this is the way to righteousness, this is not. Tithing is part of what God has given to his people to help us with our righteousness. God doesn't need our money. We use it. We use it through the church. We use it in a whole lot of different ways. God doesn't need it. We need to give our money to God. Our hearts need to give money to God so that we get our hearts right. So it's not an option. And again, there's no caveats. Another thing that I've heard before is, well, money's pretty tight right now, um, but I give my time, and that's my tithe. Or I give my talent, and that's my tithe. It is absolutely wonderful to give your time and your talent to God. It's another thing that we are called to do. But tithing is very specific. Tithing is money. Tithing is your resources. Um, if you really want to go back into it, um, you know, people back then, they weren't necessarily giving their money. In some cases, they were. They were giving the food off their plates because that's what they had. You don't think that made a difference in their lives? You don't think that was a sacrifice to say, look, we have X number of crops and that's what we eat to live. And we are going to give the first tenth of that to God. For us, it's become money. That is our resource in a lot of cases. Um, but, you know, all of this stuff, when you look through the Bible, you know, you've got examples of poor people with almost no money. You've got the example of the widow with the two pennies giving out of her poverty. Um, if that's you, if that's where you find yourself, if you find yourself looking every month at your budget and saying, well, I don't really have enough money to give to God right now. Here's what I would tell you. This is a, a practical advice part of a sermon. If that's you, you need to do the hard work of examining where you spend your money and you need to reprioritize. Absolutely need to reprioritize. You look at it with 401k investments and uh, even taxes for the government that come out of our paychecks before we ever even take our paychecks home, we don't even notice that it's gone. <laughs> It's not really much different here, except we want to notice that we've given money to God. That's a good thing. But when you make a commitment to give God his portion first, you'll find a way to still take care of what else needs to be done. It might not mean that you get all that you want, though. But if you love God and you're committed to him, you're going to learn to care less and less for the things that don't really matter. Interestingly enough, too, if you're in that position of not having enough money, you think, to, to give a tithe, to, to give back to God a portion of what is His, who do you think can change that situation the fastest? It's God. God can change that situation the fastest when you are faithful to Him. All right, so there's all the things that tithing is not. There's all the, the misconceptions and everything else. What is tithing? Tithing is the first tenth. Leviticus 27, 30. Now all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord from your wealth 
And from the first of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. In biblical times, again, crops, it, it, it was a barter system. So crops were kind of the resources. Um, so that's what they had to do. That whole equation has changed for us now. But when we get into, okay, I'm going to give the first tenth. Well, the first question I hear after that is, well, is that out of my gross income or my net income? Has anybody ever asked that question? You don't have to raise your hand, but be honest to yourself. All right. I know for us, you know, when we look at, at our girls and trying to find every opportunity to teach them lessons in just the day-to-day things of life. I'm looking forward, actually, believe it or not, I'm sure I'll regret this as soon as I say it, of the time when we get to start giving them allowance, right? Because one of the first things we want to do is start them on an envelope system. You know, here's the money for God first. Here's the money for this, for that, for whatever after that. Um, Start out with a dollar. Break it up into dimes. You put your first dime in God's envelope. There's lesson number one. You put your first dime into God's envelope. When we ask the question, you know, is it gross income or net income, we're missing the point. And we're also trying to hedge already. And that should say something about where our hearts are at in this equation. So it's the first tenth and it's regular. 1 Corinthians 16.2, on the first day of every week, Each of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections need to be made when I come. Now, this particular verse is about the special offering for the church in Jerusalem, but it it illustrates that same point of setting aside money for God and his people first and regularly. This needs to be an act that we are constantly engaged in and aware of. Tithing is also God's plan of provision for his people. Nehemiah 13, verse 10 I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. So I reprimanded the officials and said, Why has the house of God been neglected? Then I gathered them together and stationed them at their post. All Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And Acts, the the early church, Acts 4, starting in verse 34, For there was not a needy person among them, For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each to the extent that any had need. It is God's plan of provision for his people. The church, one of our callings as a church is to take care of the church. It's to take care of our brothers and sisters in Christ as any had need. It's really easy for us to get caught up in, well, who do we help? How do we help? Um, And those are really important questions to ask. It's also a really difficult area to navigate sometimes. But we're called to give to our brothers and sisters who are in need, who are unable for some reason to provide for themselves, not those who are unwilling to provide for themselves but are able That's not what he's talking about here, and nowhere does it say that. The Bible actually states the opposite. If you're able to work and you're unwilling, you'll learn when you start getting hungry. Tithing is a test. Luke 16, 11, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true wealth to you? What's the true wealth? God's message, it's Jesus Christ, it's, it's faith, it's hope, it's, a, it's, it's everything, it's all of that spiritual wealth. If you can't handle unrighteous wealth, money, if you can't handle that right, you can't be entrusted with the spiritual stuff because your heart's not right. Malachi 3.10 Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and put me to the test now in this. You do not hear God say that anywhere else. Put me to the test in this. 
says the Lord of armies. Interesting that he's called the Lord of armies here. If I do not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. You want to test to evaluate where you are in your walk with God. How much do you get back to him? If you don't act as a good steward of what little you might have financially, why would he entrust you with more? The honest truth is he won't. <laughs> he won't. But if you're a good steward, he will provide the means for you to bless even more people. That's what he's talking about. I have a great illustration of this of a, a friend of mine named Art. Now, he is Dr. Art. You would never know it. Um, I would tell you all about his past, but then I would have to kill you. But by the time I met him, he was just a very humble farmer. That is not what his past is. He's a very humble farmer. Part of his testimony is related to tithing. He took God seriously on that. Test me in this and see if I don't come through. So before he even gave his life to Christ, he said, okay, fine, I'll test you. And at a time when he was dirt poor and struggling to get by, he started giving his tithe faithfully every month. And he will tell you, I can do math. I knew what my expenses were. And I knew what my income was. And they didn't match up. And somehow, it kept working out. He still to this day has no idea how and can't explain it other than the fact that he knows he put God to the test and God came through. He gave his life to Christ and now he is one of those men that knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is in control of everything because he tested him and God said, here you go. He knows it. And you cannot meet Art and talk to Art for more than two minutes without knowing the same thing and knowing how much faith he has in God now. And it is amazing how God has blessed him to be able to reach other people. He reaches everyone that he comes in contact with. And he comes in contact with a lot of people. Tithing is a way also that God blesses us. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Now I say this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows generously will also reap generously. Each one must do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace overflow to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed." That's art in a nutshell. Tithing is also to be given freely. That's what the same passage we just read says also. Um, and I, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. In the New Testament, we are no longer beholden to pay a 10% tithe. It, it took me almost my entire sermon to get to that point and tell you, you are not beholden as New Testament men and women of God to pay a 10% tithe. Amen? You should be excited about that. We're free to give more. Amen? Amen. You're awesome. All right. Tithing. Last point on what it is. Tithing is worship. Worship comes from the old English word worship, which just denotes a worthiness of an individual to receive special honor in accordance with that worth. Trusting God by returning to Him the first portion of all that He's blessed you with is an act of worship. It's a special honor that He alone is worthy to claim and receive. It's also an act of worship because we're investing in the kingdom, which shows what we value. So now that we know what tithing is and isn't, let's get back to today's big question. What if we seek God first? What if seeking God first became the framework within which we lived every moment of our lives? Seeking Him first would drive every decision that we make. It would give us a purpose for everything that we do. Suffering is a good example of this. You can suffer pointlessly or you can suffer with purpose it's the same 
suffering. But it is totally different. It's not the same as assigning a cause to your suffering. It's not the same as saying, I'm going through this because of God. I'm going through this because of whatever. That's not what we're talking about here. It's giving you a higher purpose for how you live through that suffering. Imagine two people with terminal cancer. One person doesn't know Christ. One person, both people, both people have physical suffering. They have physical pain. One doesn't know Christ. One does. Those two people will handle that situation completely differently. And I will tell you that regardless of the outcome, one of them will go through that suffering and feel that there is a purpose for what they're going through. And it will make all the difference in the world to them. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. We have to learn to accept and work through suffering the same way Jesus did so that we can embrace living for God in the fullest rather than living to avoid suffering or living in fear. That same framework would apply to our spending decisions as well. What if we seek God first in our lives by changing the order of our financial decisions to reflect our relationship with God? Trying to figure out the least amount that you can spend, the, the least amount that you can give. This is that, is it gross, is it net, whatever question, um, can I give my time instead? <sighs> Trying to figure out that least amount to check the, the giving box misses the point entirely. Jesus doesn't want our legalism. He wants your heart, the entirety of your life. It becomes, the question becomes, how much can I give to God? How much can I give to God? Now, I'm not standing up here telling you that every single dollar that you've earned or that you have that doesn't go to put food on your table, I'm trying to think of what the other necessities are, pay for your home, food on the table, whatever, needs to go to God. God didn't even say that. I'm not going to tell you that either. Does it mean that you can never go on a vacation? No, it doesn't mean that. But there's some really interesting ways to go on vacations that bring glory to God. Hello, mission trips. Cars. Does it mean that you can't have a nice car? I would say no, but I think the answer to that is maybe. Depends on your situation. What it means is that we begin to seek ways, we begin to find ways to invest in the kingdom more. And we begin to put much less value on meaningless things. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. How many of you have heard that? All right. What is our main thing? It's God. God is our main thing. When we keep Him the main thing, every other decision orbits around Him and His kingdom. Right? Every other decision. When we get together here, when we call ourselves a church, we're not just another club or a civic group for you to belong to. We're not just another group of people or a thing to go do that makes you feel good or checks a box or looks good in the community. We're none of that. This is Jesus' body. The church is Jesus' body. And we have a clear purpose to serve His kingdom. Joyfully returning a portion of the physical blessings that God has given you becomes something that you won't even question unless it's to try to figure out how you can store up 
even more treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Why? Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. It's like being a parent. I'm starting to learn this. Whenever there is a need for your child, if it takes some sacrifice to provide that need, you do it and you don't even think. You pay no attention to what that sacrifice entails. Why? Because taking care of your kid is your priority. You don't care. And in the same way, these sacrifices become nearly irrelevant that we make in order to give more and more to the kingdom of God. Giving to God and finding ways to give more to God becomes a source of joy. Do you guys believe that? Giving more to the kingdom actually becomes a source of joy in your life. You focus far less on what you have to give up, what you have to sacrifice, and far more on pleasing God. Why? Because it brings Him and you joy. And if you can't understand that, if you can't fathom that, then hear me. God can use your money in a lot of ways, but more than anything, it is a barometer of how much you value God and of what place He occupies in your life. If you don't understand that joy, you need to reevaluate where God is in your life. If you find no joy in giving to God, pray that He would help you rediscover your love for Him. When we have that right, when our minds see money as what it is, a tool to be used by us, not a master to enslave us, when our hearts find joy in laying up treasures in heaven, then God is poised to do great things through us because our lives are His. Ephesians 3.20, Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. That's who God is. He can do so much more than we can do. So much more, we can't even fathom it. Just like those bumbling knights from Monty Python, we are poised to cross a bridge. We have to cross that bridge. We've got to stay focused on the main thing and don't get tripped up. You know your name, Christian. You know your quest because it's God-given Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just accept it, proclaim it from the rooftops. Your last question to get across is this. Will you seek God first? If you truthfully answer yes to that question, then you are ready to cross the bridge and find out what amazing things are in store for you and for this church I'm sure I'm not the only one who noticed. Did, uh, did this week's election chaos wake anybody up? Can you hear the alarm going off? Stop hitting snooze. I saw many of you get animated and passionate about a political election. I would have you get that energetic and passionate about forgiveness and eternal life. What if we seek God first? What if His blessing and pleasure meant more to us than a presidential election? Guys, this is a game changer. We're not even in the game until we get this right. Much of the Western church is not even in the game. God wants His church in the game. It is time for us to wake up, to get off the bench, to get off the sidelines, and get in the game. Seek God. God first, and we'll see him work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this has certainly been a trying week for all of us. It is certainly a difficult week for our nation, regardless of who we wanted to win politically. Father, all this election stuff, all the unknowns, all the delays, all the everything has just added more stress into our lives. But Father, I pray that in the midst of this, that we would start to recognize 
Maybe that we would be reminded again for the first time in a while that first and foremost, we are not liberals or conservatives. We are not Republicans or Democrats. We are people of God, first and foremost. We are citizens of heaven. And even before we are Americans, we are citizens of heaven. Father, I pray for the strength and the wisdom to live like it in the coming weeks and months. Father, we know that there are many challenges in the midst of a a country that seems to be split right down the middle with people who can't seem to even have a conversation about their differences, much less address them. Father, when it is the darkest, we know your light shines the brightest. Lord, today I just ask that all of us, if we would humble ourselves and pray, if we would seek you first, Father, that you would give us the burden and the blessing of being peacemakers in the midst of these troubled times. Father, help us to be a light on a hill as, as a church in this community. Help us to show love and forgiveness to everyone. Father, help us be a part of spreading the kingdom of heaven by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in the midst of the darkness. Lord, you are a good God. We apologize that we forget that sometimes. And you are God, and we forget that too. Lord, help us to seek you first, to make you the main thing. Father, for everything else, to orbit around that, to orbit around you and who you are, and the fact that you sent Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you. And we love you, and we pray for your power and blessing in our lives. And we pray it in his name. Amen. If you don't know Christ, please come talk to me and pray with me. But whatever burdens are on your heart this morning as well, and I know there are many, we talked about humbling ourselves and praying We've got to humble ourselves and pray if we are going to be part of the solution to what ails this country. It's not going to be a government. If Donald Trump won, he wasn't going to be the solution. Biden won, he's not going to be the solution. Jesus Christ is the only solution, and therefore it has to start with, start with us as God's people. Whatever burdens are on your heart after this past week, I pray that you would just bring them up to the altar Take a knee, stand here at the foot of the cross, give it back to God, trust in Him, seek Him first.